Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the session on Thailand's business leaders to share vision and experiences on net zero transformation. We all know that non-state actors can play a crucial role for net zero economy transformation. So this session, we have three business leaders from three different sectors in Thailand to share their corporate's ambitious vision of a transition to net zero emissions by identifying their ambitious and decarbonized business models. Our first speaker of this session is Mr. Dan Pathomwanit, CEO of NR Instant Produce Public Company Limited or NRF. NRF is the company with goal to use food to fight climate change. So we have to listen to him how he makes it. May I invite Mr. Dan Pathomwanit to the stage? Please. May I now give the floor to you, Dan. The floor is yours. Hello. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so, uh, good, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, my name is Dan. I've uh, I've been slightly involved with COP, both on a personal and corporate level, um, specifically around food, um, agriculture, and coastal communities. Um, so, so with that, um, hold on. Okay, there, got it. Um, so, we, we, I don't have to repeat what everybody knows at this point, right? But I would like to maybe add some color uh, on the impact of uh, Southeast Asia across, um, you know, the, the, the next two scenarios in which um, I think, I think um, m many people probably acknowledge at this point we're not going to um, achieve a 1.5 um, degree world. Um, so the problem, once we get to the three degree scenario in Thailand from a, uh, from a food perspective, is we will lose one growing season by 2050, um, peak humidity, um, or the wet bulb effect, um, but peak humidity will reach 100% by 2050. And if we lose one complete growing cycle, then we have issues with respect to the agriculture sector, um, as well as uh, um, food security um, for both, um, you know, obviously domestic consumption and export. And so um, I, I think when we think about um, the transition to net zero, um, Thailand has done a fairly good job, and we've come from, I think, critically insufficient um, if people have been following Thailand's progress, now to, I think, um, decently, um, uh, a, decent, a decent leading regional um, player within sustainability and, and the, the path to net zero. Um, if you look, and this is an old slide, but I just want to commend, um, from a private sector perspective, uh, um, the Stock Exchange of Thailand and the SEC has done a pretty good job in terms of requiring listed companies to have annual sustainability reports and now to actually commit to reporting carb carbon emissions. Um, and so uh, across the different um, public companies, including many here, um, the, we've, actually, we've actually had a very decent market share within a lot of the um, ESG sustainability indexes um, around the world. And I, I think this is a tremendous um, achievement um, if you think that we are coming from a critically insufficient um, baseline. Um, for our company, um, like, like other companies, um, I'm not going to go into any of um, basically what we're doing, uh, but you know, we've, we've, um, our, our focus outside of ESG, triple bottom line, um, and uh, we're, we're one of the first to actually um, join the race to net zero, and uh, we, have a, we have a focus now is how do we transition the entire food supply chain um, within an ASEAN context to net zero. And I think if you think about the hard to abate sectors, um, you know, you think about industry, you think of uh, energy, you think of cement, pesticide, et cetera. I would argue, I would argue that agriculture is probably the hardest industry 
um, to transition to net zero. Um, and I'm going to go to that um, um, in this next few slides. And it's it's a it's an issue that's um, very relevant to my supply chain as a food manufacturer. Um, we you know we use um, more than 10,000 farmers across all our different factories within our ecosystem, and uh, it's quite problematic. And so, uh, you know, we've we've started off with stakeholder engagement. We did the typical path: how do we get to carbon neutral? We're now like the third, um, the only uh, food uh, food factory that's uh, four years carbon neutral certified. But then the move to um, basically net zero, um, of course, is the the most difficult transition, right? Within scope one, two, and three. Um, and if you think about hard to abate, how do you transition, if you think about on a country perspective, 14 million farmers, right, onto uh, a net zero path. 14 million farmers, which will fall to 9 million, probably by 2050, um, and then we actually will lose one growing cycle. So it's very problematic, very problematic. And how do we do that in a world where we constantly fight inflation? Um, so, um, the primary um, challenge um, facing the food and agricultural system um, within Thailand, if you ask, if you ask my, my, uh, my personal opinion, um, is really around uh, agriculture burning. So residue burning on fields. Okay, this is problematic uh, on a global basis. Okay, so within ASEAN, um, transboundary, so Thailand, Laos, etc. you know, the African continent, India, um, across basically most of the developing world, uh, one of the key challenges that we will find very difficult to abate from a net zero perspective is to stop basically the, pr the practice of residue burning. Um, you can see here um, all this residue, right? And the effect is um, basically in Thailand alone, okay? And the problem is there, is a, there really is no data set. And so as a private sector um, player, right, if we cannot identify and properly assess almost on a daily basis and work with government and stakeholders, how do we stop agriculture residue burning? Um, it's, it's gonna be extremely difficult. Um, so we estimate, based on all the data that we've co collected, um, Thailand probably burns around 18 to 20 million metric tons of agriculture residue or stubble, whether it's corn, rice, et cetera. Um, this is why the northern part of Thailand becomes one of the most polluted um, areas in the world. Um, more, than a million, more than a million people hospitalized. And uh, it's, it's, it's problematic because it's part of our supply chain. And we cannot not include, right, within our scope three emissions, right, agriculture residue burning. You can't, right? And so <clears throat> if you think about this, it's just not a Thailand problem. Right? So if you look at, um, for example, Myanmar burns, right? Where does that, wh where, um, what, um, Vietnam burns, Laos burns. And so when you think about from a food systems transformation perspective, which I think is a theme of this particular COP, right? Is that we can no longer um, transition standalone. We must transition systematically and not just within a country or private sector perspective, right? Um, but within a regional uh, uh, connected perspective. Um, you know, as they burn, the entire region burns. And so if you look at the entire region during the burning season, which has just started for the next five months, okay, the entire region is literally burning. Um, most of the burning is coming from this data here, um, which you can read and I, w I won't say too much about. But if we think about it globally, okay, um, it's probably estimated, and the, the problem is there's no data, right? And if there's no data, how do you know that your economy, and especially the agriculture sector, which represents 30% of carbon emissions and 50% of methane emissions, is actually net zero, right? And so um, if you look at the different regions, um, Southeast Asia as a region is the top, uh, is the top um, uh, uh, um, region of agriculture residue burning. And then India as a country is the single largest country. Um, and then you've got um, China, um, you've got the African um, continent. Even in the United States, you've got burning, but that uh, probably represents more of wildfire than it is actually an intentional burning. So why, why is this um, relevant to me as a private sector company um, and um, other than a concerned uh, father with, with children, right? Um, so uh, it's our net zero commitments and how we as a food company in Thailand with the supply chain in, in Thailand 
can actually tr uh, move to a, sub um, a, a net zero supply chain. And so, you know, we've invested in multiple startups, um, both at industrial scale, um, carbon capture, um, down to basically biochar. Um, and I, I, I think uh, the, the larger problem is the world is very caught up in technologically advanced, um, call it cool factor technology. Um, you know, which probably costs six to seven hundred dollars per carbon removal ton to fund, um, which is impo impossible, right? Um, the WTO has already said um, on, at this COP, right, that we need an equitable carbon pricing across the world. Um, and so, how can you do equitable carbon pricing when um, most of the interest is in direct to air um, direct to air capture? Right, you can't, right? And that's because the majority of the emissions coming from the food and agriculture sector. Um, is actually coming from um, uh, not just pesticides and these hard to abate um, um, issues, but actually stubble burning, right? So if you think about it, the 20 million metric tons of stubble burning in Thailand represents probably um, 28 million metric tons of carbon emitted, right? 28 million met metric tons of carbon emitted represents 9% of Thailand's total emissions, right? How do you move to net zero if you can't convince 14 million farmers to stop burning? So we've, we've come up and um, we've been thinking through over the past, how many minutes do I have left? I, I can talk forever, I've gotta stop. <laughs> um, somebody warned me, somebody warned me, okay. Um, but, so um, we, we've looked through and we've worked across villages, communities at farmer level. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, 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 factories in the United States, Arizona, Arkansas, in Canada on carbon removal. And the simplest thing is basically biochar. So um, you take the residue from stubble production, um, you, bear, you convert it into an emissions-free process, and you bury it in the fields, in your supply chain. So um, we're very happy. We just started our first, um, we just got our first village um, up and running. Um, and we're gonna start in this, uh, this January. So it's a village of uh, 200 households in the northern part of Thailand. Um, Thailand has 79,000 villages, okay? Um, and so essentially, um, it's a fairly common and simple method to basically go to net zero, right? So um, rather than have them burn, releasing CO2 in the atmosphere and particulate matter, um, we buy the crop residue. So my company buys the crop residue, so we tell them, listen, um, don't burn. And the reason they burn, right, is often they're uneducated or they don't have the means to hire people to basically collect all the residue, right? So we hire them, right? We burn it in a kin um, through um, paralysis, um, which basically doesn't emit, it, it, emits, um, it, it emits like 0.5% point, like point um, uh, emissions in particular matter, right? Um, what, is, what is the result um, is basically um, this, this, um, this black matter here, which is solidified carbon. And when you, uh, this solidified carbon, basically when you bury it in the soil, um, improves productivity of soil by 30%, and um, improves water retention. Um, as well. So super common technology, um, super simple. It's done across the world. This needs to be scaled. And what we're going to try to do um, is if we can scale, what we think is if we can scale with this village, then we'll go from one to 100, 100 to 1,000, 1,000 to hopefully 10,000. So 2080 roll. If we can get 20% of the villages in Thailand enrolled, um, we could probably stop 14 million tons of stubble burning, 20 million tons of CO2 avoided. We could probably save 14,000 lives that people who die from uh, air pollution um, and we'll generate 67,000 credits in carbon removal. Um, the one village will actually bring one of our factories to net zero. Um, so we will see within the next four months. Um, but I would say this um, to end, to end, um, well almost end. Um, today marks the passing of a very famous, uh, prominent person in Thailand. He's a famous doctor, and he's been a champion of clean air, and he died because of air pollution in the northern part of Thailand. Um, you know, rest in peace. Um, unfortunately, um, he died this morning. And um, so this is a very real thing. And I think not a lot of people um, understand um, um, the problems that we have. It's, it's just not, so like it, the, the, the second day, um, they already announced the health initiative de declaration, right? So um, you've got to combine health, environment, um, and, and climate. 
And so I want to end with this um, and something that we're trying to champion. Um, we're going to try and champion basically a no burn, um, very similar to the, the Rainforest Alliance. Um, so basically, it's a simple logo, okay? Um, the key stakeholders are brand owners and supermarkets um, who are basically the drivers of adoption. And um, we're currently buying supermarkets, so our supermarkets definitely will have it. But essentially, it's self-certification based, okay? So you certify, but you're going to also warrant to the consumer opening yourself up to class action lawsuit that none of your raw materials came from, raw, from uh, stubble burning, right? And I believe it will be relevant um, for, for consumers during the burning season, and hopefully we can get companies to adopt. But um, I think um, for our, for our um, journey to net zero, we hope to play a role in the ecosystem. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everybody for listening to me. Um, uh, and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Kuntan, uh, for your comprehensive presentation. And uh, our next speaker is Mr. Daniel Ross, Chief Investment Officer, Head of the Sustainability Department, BTS Group Holding Public Company Limited. BTS Group's vision is to serve the community through the development of sustainable public transportation infrastructures to drive socioeconomic expansion for Thailand. Mr. Ross will share with us the BDS Group's experiences on accelerate the net zero transition in rail transport. May I invite Daniel to the stage, please. May I now give the floor to you. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, firstly, welcome to uh, the Thai Pavilion. Thank you for coming here to listen. Um, I'm grateful to the Ministry of Environmental and uh, Natural Resources and also the Department of Climate Change for inviting me to speak here today. My name is Daniel Ross. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of BTS Group Holdings. Uh, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, net zero transportation in the transportation industry. Before I do so, let me tell you a little bit about our three business units so you know if you're not familiar with BTS Group. Can I get a, a mic, please, which is a, a, a long mic? Thank you. So we have three business units, Move, Mix, and Match. Move, unsurprisingly, is about transportation. Transportation of people from door to door. So most people, of, most people here from Thailand will know us from our transportation business where we're ferrying people on the BTS SkyTrain uh, for the last 20 or so years. But we also operate the pink and the yellow line together a total of 138 kilometers. We're less known for our non-rail business, where we're also operating buses. We're doing EV motorcycles, feeding people, so first and last mile to the trains. We're doing ferries, motorways, and we're also building uh, a third airport, or a third of Bangkok's airport, which is uh, close to Pattaya. Secondly, our mix business. Mix is essentially how we reach our customers. It's a combination of many different things. We have the largest out-of-home advertising network in Thailand. We have retail stations on our store, uh, retail, re retail stores on our stations. Uh, we have payment, loyalty, and data, which essentially enables us, as well as our customers, our advertising customers, to easily reach their audience in a targeted manner. And finally, Match, where we're investing with other companies in Thailand, we buy basically 10 to 20% of companies who want to use our move and mix platform and grow their share of audience. Okay? And we have investments in financial services, FMB, uh, hospitality, to name a few other sectors. BTS Group is the world's most sustainable transportation company, as ranked by the Dow Jones Sustainability Index for the last four years. We've serviced four billion trips 
when I say sustainable trips, were essentially zero emissions at the point of use, which has helped avoid over two million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent through modal shift. And we've also raised 1.7 billion worth of green financing, enabling investors to benefit in green and eligible investments. Now, because we're an electric car, co electric train company, we have a very low carbon footprint, only 80,000 tons, scope one and scope two. And you can see that compares with the average of the set 50, uh, 3.6 million tons, so very favorably. We're a, we're a relatively good boy. So the set 50 is the largest 50 listed companies in Thailand, of which we are, we are one of them. So whilst it's fashionable now to see electric cars, um, I like to remind people that we were their first EV since 1999. Back in the 1990s, our chairman, Kun Kiri Kanjanapas, had the bold and pioneering vision to enable Bangkokians have clean, safe, and punctual mass transit. Then Bangkok was notorious for terrible traffic and awful pollution. And thanks to our efforts over the last 30 years, the traffic is still terrible and the pollution is worse. But being new to something isn't something that dissuades us. We've often taken the pioneering role. Um, in the 1990s, when we bid for the first electric concession in Bangkok, um, it may seem obvious that the first concession would be an electric rail concession, but actually the two other bidders, one was an elevated diesel bus lane in 2013, we launched Thailand's first infrastructure fund. Okay. It was the world's largest, sorry, Thailand's largest private sector IPO in its history at the time. In 2020, we became carbon neutral, 30 years ahead of Thailand's stated goal for 2050. Sadly, we're also the first company to simultaneously sue the national government and the simultaneous uh, and the and the city government to this day they still owe us 2 billion bar 2 billion dollars worth of contracted payments under their contracts and uh, we we're, we're hoping for a resolution of that soon hard truths net zero 2050 more hard truths bts group is not yet committed to net zero. <laughs> so it's like up here on stage talking about net zero transformation, NRF, net zero committed, PTT, net zero committed. BTS is not yet committed to net zero 2050. So why? Uh, one, one or two key reasons. One, we don't yet have a realistic pathway confirmed in how to achieve that. So we want to get that ready first, a realistic pathway to achieve net zero, which doesn't involve becoming a renewable energy company and doesn't involve planting trees across half of Thailand. Because as you know, PTT are already doing that and who are we to compete with them? The second hesitation that I have with net zero is that I feel like there's some guilt by association with net zero. And this may be more of a personal viewpoint. I think a lot of people are hiding in net zero. A lot of polluters are hiding in net zero, um, some with no realistic plan of achieving it, and some, dare I say it, with no intention of achieving it. Uh, needless to say, I think we will get to approve net zero uh, next year when, we've approved, when we have a realistic plan in place. In the meantime, we will remain a carbon neutral company, uh, which we do so because it, even though it's made in many ways more expensive and harder than net zero in the short term, we think that it sends a good beacon to others. Moving on from hard truths now to more realistic ambitions. Net zero rail transportation. Do I think that's possible? Absolutely. India has 70,000 kilometers of rail and they've set carbon neutral for net zero rail at 2030. The United Kingdom, net zero rail 2050, they have 16,000 kilometers. So Thailand, with 4,000 kilometers, that should be quite possible. So Thai net zero rail and even global net zero rail. 
should be the relatively easy part of the puzzle to solve. After all, the technology is there already. Have the all we have to do is electrify the train and the tracks, uh, have enough renewable energy to supply it. But before I go on to net zero, beyond this, I just want to say that even the easy portion needs about three things to happen as a prerequisite. Otherwise, there will be no progress. The first thing that needs to happen is it needs to be legislated. Okay. If we look at three of the most successful countries in reducing annual CO2 emissions, we have three countries here. The UK, they've reduced carbon dioxide by 39% over a 21-year period. We have France, 25%, and Sweden in yellow, a 35% reduction over a 21-year period. The commonality of all these three countries is that they legislated it early, and Thailand needs to follow suit. The second thing that needs to happen is we need to clean the grid. Obviously, net zero relies heavily on renewable energy. It can't be the case that every company needs to become a renewable energy company. We need to utilize centralized infrastructure and have a clean grid. And finally, funding the transition. Net zero is expensive. Who is going to pay for it? I often say sustainability is a choice, affordable, only for those who can afford it. So in Thailand, for example, we have street food vendors that serve food to much of the country, and I'm often horrified at the volume of single-use plastics that they do when, they have, when they're serving one dish. But can we tax them for it? Would they survive? Absolutely not. So the government needs to put in place a funding mechanism to allow all participants in the economy to transition to net zero in a fair manner. There also needs to be two key principles that enshrine this funding mechanism. One is a polluter pays principle, but that needs to be combined with an incentive to encourage early behavior. So as the late Charlie Munger said, show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome. Back to rail. Rail only accounts for 0.1% of emissions. Uh, and this is 2022 data. 20% is from transportation. Net zero transport must be the goal. And in order to achieve that, rail needs to be at the forefront. Again, it's great to see lots of EVs on the road, but that's only representing a drop in the ocean in terms of making net zero transport. We need to address supply chain issues, battery recycling, affordability. Not everybody can afford a Tesla. We need to address the marine and aero segments as well as freight. So in order to make net zero transport possible, governments need to reorient their net zero transport plan around a backbone of rail, a backbone of an electric rail. Rail is cleaner and quieter. It's affordable. It benefits from economies of scale. There needs to be investment in rail network expansion for both people and goods. Empowering commuters, driving change. This needs to be stimulated. This modal shift needs to be stimulated. And BTS Group is standing there ready to help Thailand achieve its targets under the nationally determined contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Um, next, may I follow through our session with Mr. Warapong Nakchatri, Executive Vice President of Sustainability Management, PTT Public Company Limited. PTT is Thailand's national oil and gas company and one of the largest and 
a leading corporate in oil and gas in Asia Pacific, may invite Mr. Morapong to um, give the presentation. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Ministry of Natural Resource and Environment, Department of Climate Change and Environment, and Thailand Greenhouse Gas Management Organization for inviting PDT to participate uh, in this session. It's very, very uh, great pleasure to me to be here on behalf of uh, Thailand. First, PDT as a state enterprise of Thailand. Even though PDT, we already changed uh, our vision, uh, powering life with future energy and beyond. This one, we try to change our vision to support low carbon society. But, at, but anyhow, everyone may know, uh, we still deliver oil and gas as the major energy for Thailand. Because one of uh, our mission is to secure our uh, energy of Thailand with affordable price. This one is a very, very important one. We could not change our uh, oil and gas immediately. But some of them, we already changed, especially the coal business. We already exist from the coal business. Uh, next slide, please. According to the International Energy Agency uh, Energy Outlook, you can see on the, on the screen, uh, the, for the coal demand, will be de reduced or decreased more than the oil demand. However, for the gas demand, you can see it's still uh, increased for a long time because gas is a transition fuel that we may need to get it because it's cleaner compared with uh, coal and oil. When we talk about the net zero, to achieve to net zero, we have to do many things. We need to have a full time of the renewable energy. We need to reduce fossil fuel by 50%. And also for the EV car, we need to have it on the road around 75%. This thing, it will make a lot of change for this world. This one, we can uh, say, it may or may not happen because uh, we can see the, how can we get the full time of uh, renewable energy. Very, very difficult for this one. But anyhow, for the PTT and PTT group, we try to do it. And also for the Thailand, we have a national energy plan. In that one, they plan to have a 50% of a renewable energy or power by 2050. And also they try to say for the EV car or EV vehicle production, they need to have at least 30% within 2030. This one also is very tough challenge for the Thailand also. Anyhow, for the PDT, we have a way to do to go to the net zero emission. We 
fly to many way, many way that but, but we can conclude in the, we call the 3P decarbonization pathway. Let me let you know about the first P that we have. We call the pursuit of lower emission. This one PET will try to reduce GHG emission and use energy with the best efficiency for all business and production process in the PET. As we know, the, if we could not avoid to have a CO2 emission, we may capture it or utilize it as a CCU. And maybe we can keep it in the big storage as a CCS. Currently, PT have uh, implemented uh, the CCU project, especially the sodium bicarbonate project that we expect to complete it by 2025. And also our flagship company, PTT EP, also have a first CCS for Thailand that we expect to complete it by 2027. For the hydrogen also PT, we have uh, some project for the hydrogen turbine and we already blend the hydrogen into our natural gas pipeline. This thing is, we hope, we will achieve the pursuit of lower emission. Moving to the second P. PT, uh, we will uh, diversify the, our business model from the existing business model to future energy and beyond business. We will uh, first, we will let you know first, we already exist coal business in February uh, 2023. This one is a big challenge for us because the uh, coal business also right now is quite is a high side for the demand. But anyhow, we already exist for the coal business. And also we already increased the renewable energy target from the 12 gigawatt to be the 15 gigawatt to make it greener energy. But for the PET group itself, in our process area, we try to achieve to use the around 350 megawatt in our process area by 2030. This one also uh, for the, the EV car PET group, we already support our country to promote the use of the EV car. Someone may know right now the EV car that make the new register, uh, register the EV car. Right now it's rising around seven times compared to the year 2020. That's why uh, PT Group uh, try to support and try to expand the uh, EV charging uh, structure, infrastructure around uh, to get the uh, around 600 station across Thailand. Come to the third P. Uh, this one is a uh, we will have a partnership with nature and society. PT have a collaboration with the government and community to increase the natural carbon sink by reforestation and conservation of uh, Thailand forest. 
our PT group aim to uh, reforest around two million rice. It's uh, around uh, 30, 20, uh, 320,000 hectares by the year 2030. And also, we will have uh, another one million rice from the PT group subsidiary to make sure we will get the whole uh, two million right from the PT group. For the year 2023, uh, 20, this year, we already completed the, the plan, plan the tree around 86,000 right already. This one is a big challenge for the first year uh, for us also. And we believe that the forest we will help develop watershed area, boost the biodiversity, and create economic value for the Thai community. Since 1994, this PT has uh, volunteer to run the reforestation project on one million rice. That one is a uh, around almost 30 years ago. Up to now, PC still uh, maintain and protect the existing one uh, continuously up to now. And we can see the, for the GHG removal that we achieved until last year is around 32 million ton equivalent. Not only the the forest reforestation project, uh, PDT, but also PDT has to be the three learning center to keep and deliver the knowledge of the reforestation for the Thailand country. With the, the first one is the Sirinath Rajini, this one in the Prajop Kirikan. The second one is uh, PT Wangjan Forest in Rayong. And the third one is uh, PT Metro Forest. This one is uh, in uh, Bangkok. That we can handle the people who would like to see or to get the reforestation knowledge. The, for the collaboration, as you know, the PT, we commit to achieve the net zero by 2050, but we cannot do alone. We need to have the collaboration with the government sector, with the local community to achieve the target of the net zero together. In fact, uh, this one, we have uh, some uh, project with the community, for example, the, the biogas from the pig farm. This one reduce the, a lot of the greenhouse gas and can increase the community to share a practical knowledge on the energy management to other uh, community also. And for the smart farming, this one we, uh, PT group, we promote to use the innovation technology and engineering expertise to help the community to improve the agricultural product. What we have shared today is not just a presentation, it's our collective uh, vision for a sustainable future. We are turning that vision to be reality. We need walk the talk. Our commitment to achieve net zero emission is not just co corporate strategy. It's our agreement to the world and the next generation. Last but not least, we strongly believe that to make the world better, all of us need to act it now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Mr. Warapong Nakshatri. And now I think that we have come to the end of this session that we all heard from business leaders in Thailand, from BTS Group, Rail Transport Business Leader, PTT, the oil and gas business leader, and NRF, the food industry leader. L ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Thailand Greenhouse Gas Management Organization under the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, we would like to express our sincere thanks and appreciation to all our distinguished speakers for your active participation today at Thailand's pavilion, COP28 in Dubai. Can we give a big applause to our speakers, please? Thank you. And finally, may I invite Dr. Pirun Sayasit Panit, Secretary General of the Office of Natural Resources and Environmental Policy and Planning, to present token of appreciation to our speakers, please. a great rest of your day. Oh, we have a group photo, please. Ka, uh, group photo, need them, they may come.